When it comes to praising of the Lord, when it comes to celebrating the Lord, when it comes to worship of the Lord, spare no expense, spare no word, spare no action, because that is the only thing we can give to him. We can't offer him our money, really. We can't offer him any other thing. Even our time, we can't, because he first gave us that time. There's nothing we can offer to him. So when it comes to praise, when it comes to worship, when it comes to celebrating the Lord, spare no expense, spare no word. Spare no action. Whatever the Spirit of God puts in your hand, do. They know whatever that person is doing. Let your heart pour out to him even now. Thank you. Thank you, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. We have come to celebrate your victory. Your victory over the enemy. The victory over the powers of darkness. We have come to celebrate that you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We have come to celebrate that you are the Alpha, the Omega. We have come to pour our love, our life to you, O oh God. Dead men can praise you, O oh God. No one can worship you from the grave. And so we that are alive today, we that we are mentioned in the land of the living, we offer you the sacrifice of praise and worship and honor. We have come this morning with a bucket of praise. We have come this morning with vows of worship, O oh God. We have come, O oh God, with rivers of thanksgiving, O oh Lord, our Father, our God. We remember your goodness to us in the land of the living. We remember your kindness, O oh God. Come on, let your mouth be filled with praise. Come on, let the house be filled with worship. The presence of God, the devil, Shalaba, is attracted when there is praise, when there is worship. Angels visit where there is praise. Jehovah inhabits the praise of his people. If you want to see God, then you praise him. If you want to see God, then worship him. Do I have any praises in the house? Do I have anyone that worships in the house? Do I have men that are from the tribe of David in the house today? Thank you, oh God. What an honor it is. The Bible said, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath honor Jesus. For he deserves it all. And even much more. We bow today, oh God. In honor, in worship, in thanksgiving. Thank you, great King. Thank you, loving Father. As our praise, worship, and thanksgiving rise up to you today, oh God, as sweet incense, Father. We ask that you accept it and you rain down your word today. Rain down your word, my Father. Let it bring direction. Let it bring guidance. Let it bring inspiration. Let it bring chastisement, oh God. Let it put us where we're meant to be, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Spirit of the living God, we thank you today. I thank you particularly for your ministry that never fails. The ministry of opening up our understanding to understand the scripture. Thank you. Thank you this morning. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise this morning. We'll be sharing very briefly and very quickly from God's word. We're trusting that God will bring that word to you that will change you and make you to become all that God has planned for you to be from the one. Hallelujah. And if you're a father listening out there, happy Father's Day. So today we're going to be looking at the things that shape the life of a man. Because there are many things, or there are many, what do I call them? There are many things that shape the outcome of a person's life. How a person turns out is shaped by several factors. Nobody suddenly becomes a certain way. Nobody automatically sleeps and wakes up a certain way. Certain things shape who you eventually become. There are many things that do that. I'll quickly tell you one of them, for instance, is the environment that a person grows up in. The environment you are raised in, the environment you are exposed to, shapes the outcome of your life. Another thing that shapes the outcome of a person's life, for instance, um, are prophetic words that are said over a man or a woman. Those prophetic words that are spoken over you, 
it goes a large way in shaping how you turn out in life. And the patriarchs, those who work with God, they completely understand this. And which is why one of the things that the patriarchs from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, if you go to the New Testament, Paul, all those people, they understood the power of the words, prophetic words said over a man. And so when the prophets, when the fathers were handing over, when they were about to die, they knew that the important thing to hand over to their children was not the land or the cattle or all those things. They knew there was something they needed to hand over that was beyond material possession. So you see, when Abraham was about to die, he spoke certain words to Isaac. The same from Isaac to Jacob. Maybe we should even look at a few examples. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 49 verse 1. Just to quickly look at that aspect of the things that shape the life of a man. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 49 verse 1. He says, and Jacob called his sons. He learned this by working with God. He also learned it by seeing what happened in his life. By virtue of what Isaac spoke to him. And he also saw that this was what happened in the life from what Abraham did to Isaac and Isaac to Jacob. And the Bible says, and Jacob called his sons and said, gather together that I may tell you what shall before you in the last days. What he was saying is, I'm about to release certain words. And I know that when I speak these words over your life, this is what your life is going to become. These words I'm going to speak, it will shape the outcome of your life. That portion of the land called Israel, where the world has marked out to be Israel, that portion of the land was shaped because that was what Abraham saw and that was what he spoke into existence. That portion of the land. Let's take a look at another person quickly. I just want to fly through the Deuteronomy 33 verse 1. Now, this is the blessing which Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. Why was this important? Because Moses understood the power of the prophetic word and how it can shape the life of a man. How it can shape the life of a woman. And so Moses knew, I am going over now. I have given them lands. I have given them the portion, the inheritance. I have handed over to jo Joshua. Joshua actually was the one that shared that portion literally to them because the Bible tells us that Joshua even handed the portion for Caleb and all that so Moses knew beyond the land beyond the things I'm handing over to them in the physical these prophetic words are going to shape Israel and the things that Moses spoke prophetically over Israel if you studied that was exactly what they become let's take a look 27 37 of the book of Genesis this is the way of the patriarchs this is the ways of our fathers this is what God taught them to do. This is what shapes a man's life. This is one of the things that shapes a man's destiny. The Bible says, Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, Remember um, the story of Esau and what? Jacob. Isaac had told his son because he wanted to hand over something. He was old and advanced in age. He wanted to hand over wealth to his son, Esau. Isaac went in his place and then Isaac began to speak prophetic words to shape the life of, he, in his mind, he thought he was shaping the life of Esau, but it was actually um, Jacob he was shaping. And so when es Esau came and then this is what Isaac said, then Isaac answered and said to Esau, indeed, I have made him your master. How did this happen? Did he take Jacob and say, you are now the master of Esau? No, by prophetic utterances, by the word spoken. The power of Jacob to become the master of Esau was settled. His faith was sealed. Indeed, I have made him your master and all his brethren. I have given him a servant. <laughs> With grain and wine, I have sustained him. Did Isaac take grain and wine and give Jacob? No, he just spoke it into being. He knew that those words he spoke would shape the outcome of Jacob's finances. So the prophetic words that are said have a way of shaping a man's life. These are one of the things that can shape your life. I've talked about environment, I've talked about words, prophetic words, but I'm going to tell you the greatest thing that shapes the outcome of a man's life. How you turn out. Because somebody might be thinking, well, I can't remember anybody saying any prophetic word over my life. And I grew up in a wrong environment. Maybe you grew up in some downside of Africa, or some downside of Asia, or even some downside of England, and you're thinking to yourself, okay, great. So the environment I grew up in is already bad. Nobody spoke any nice word over me. In fact, all the words they said over me were destructive words. My father said to me, it would not be well with you 
And my mother said to me, you will not prosper. What do I do? So because God is a God who is fair and wants to give everybody a chance, he puts what shapes the life of every man in that man so that nobody will blame any other person. That power to shape the outcome of your life, he put it in your hands. Because somebody can say a prophetic word over you, but if you don't activate in this particular one I'm about to say, you will still lose out on the prophetic word. The prophetic word goes a long way to shape the outcome of a man's destiny. But there's something that God has put in your hand that will decide your destiny. What is that? It is what is called H-A-B-I-T. Habits. Habits. That is why today we're going to look at the habits of a healthy soul. We're going to study the habits for a healthy soul. A healthy life. Because you are the outcome of your habits. The things you do consistently, they are shaping your life. The secret of your future is hidden in your habits. The habits that you are forming is not just something you are doing. It is your life that you are shaping. So God coded the power of your tomorrow. He put it in that thing called the habits you are forming on a daily basis. Jesus made it a point of duty to form certain habits. So what habits exactly have you formed? What habits are you forming? If you're not conscious of the habits that you are forming, the chances are you are growing carelessly and wildly and the chances are you will not turn out so well spiritually because there are habits you must form compose really if you are going to have a healthy life. Another way to put it is the enemies of a healthy spiritual life. What these habits are will amaze you, some of them. Some of us, those particular habits that will build us are the ones we have despised and neglected. And that is why our spiritual growth has been stunted. But everybody who has formulated this habit, as we see in the scripture, and the life of anyone who has made sense in the kingdom of God, you see those things strong. So what are those habits of a healthy life? What habits are you actually forming? Which ones are you developing? Do you know that some people are developing the habit of prayerlessness? It's a habit they form. They don't realize they're forming a habit. They form the habit of a prayerless life. And just an, as an aside, four types of prayerlessness. Some of you have prayerlessness. You don't realize that's what you have. So let me tell you the four types of prayerlessness. Number one, people who do not pray at all. That is only one type of prayerlessness. And I think that is one we recognize. And that is one we call, this person does not have a prayer life. But you are wrong because there are three other types that people practice. And that is still prayerlessness. The second type of prayerlessness is people who pray emergency prayers. That is, they pray only when there is a problem. When there's an exam to write. When they're about to travel. When they're about to make a decision. Maybe as a minister, when you're about to pray, that is the only time you know you will start praying and you start fasting. You don't have a prayer life. The third kind of prayer lesson is what is called public prayer only. PPO. The only prayer they pray is when they come publicly. They only pray corporately. They don't have a personal prayer life. PPO, public prayer only. That is all. Jesus said this type of people... Whenever they want to pray is when they come in the public. Some people can burn one hour, two hours, as long as it's corporate prayer. But on their own, they can't have that same one hour with God. That's a kind of prayerlessness. The fourth kind of prayerlessness. These are people who pray daily, but they make no connection. You still don't have a prayer life. Because prayer is about making contact with God. So if you go to pray and you don't make contact, do not deceive yourself. You have knelt down, you have said some words, but you did not pray. Because prayer is about making contact. I know this because the Bible says times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. How you know you have contacted God is there's a refreshing that comes to your spirit. There's a refreshing that comes to your soul. So when that refreshing is missing after your prayer, you didn't make contact. Do you know when you make contact with God? Difficult to keep your eyes dry. You begin to cry out to God. You know, your eyes are running with tears and all of that. And you know, you know that you know that you know you contacted God. When you pray, you don't contact God. You have not prayed, even though you have said certain words. And people go through like that. And because they are doing this on a daily basis, they assume they have a prayer life. Meanwhile, they don't have a prayer life. As far as heaven is concerned, you don't have a prayer life. So people don't get used to that. You are forming a habit of prayerlessness. So when you don't deliberately make a habit of prayer, 
What you are doing is you have formed a habit of prayerlessness. And I'll tell you from research, it is easier to build a habit than to break one. The energy you need to break a habit is higher, much more, three times higher than the energy you need to build a habit. It is much easier to build than to destroy when it concerns habits. So what habits exactly are you forming? They are habits of a healthy soul. They are also enemies of spiritual health. So maybe we should do a little bit of work on how Jesus lived his life. Let's look at Luke chapter 4 verse 13. If you're not aware of that, if I tell you to write three habits that you have formed for your spiritual health, you know what is a habit? A habit is something you do constantly that has become your lifestyle, that has become part of you. If I ask you now, write three habits you have developed since you gave your life to Christ. Most people find it difficult to write even one that they have deliberately built. But you see what the Bible says, um, I'm reading from Luke chapter 4 verse 16 actually. The Bible says, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up as was his custom, as and as his custom was, what does custom mean? Let's look at other verbs of custom. We can look at another translation just to help you out. Okay, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. Some will tell you as was his habit. Some will tell you as was his manner. So Jesus deliberately formed certain habits as was his custom. The other translation we just saw said, as he does usually. He went as usual. He made it a habit. He was consciously building a habit of always going to the synagogue. Because if he didn't make it a habit, some days you decide, okay, well, today I'm tired. Today it rained. Tomorrow this. Next tomorrow that. You build, you do something consistently until it becomes a lifestyle. Let's take a look. Maybe someone will say, oh, that's Jesus. Let's take a look at Paul. Acts 17 verse 2. Acts 17 verse 2 tells us, as was Paul's custom, Paul developed certain habits. He went to the synagogue service and for three Sabbaths in a row, he used the scripture to reason with the people. The same thing that Jesus had formed a habit doing. Jesus had a habit of not just going to the synagogue, but of sharing the word of God with people. Paul formed the habit. I can show you different people who formed habits of going to the house of God, sharing different habits that they formed. I already told you the habit that the uh, ancestors did. They made it a habit to bless their children. They made it a habit to transfer patriarchal blessing. They made it a habit to speak prophetic words over people. In Africa, we have the opposite. You know, if your mother has not told you that may God punish you, that mother has not started raising you. Three or four. I think it's changing a little bit now. But you know, if it's evil, they will say, Kitikpa wa wo gebawa. True or false? They would have said it two times. I don't even know what Kitikpa is. You know, but I've heard it so many times. I can say the words, even if I don't know the English or bad. They'll tell you, Kitikpa wa wo geba. And you know, these are words that have been spoken over children. This lazy boy, these are the, the, the parent position has a power to build the life of somebody else. Yeah? So, what habits? So let's take a look at habits for a healthy soul. The first habit that you need to build if you're going to have a healthy soul, a healthy spiritual life, you're going to build a habit of dissatisfaction. And let me put it in another way. Remember I told you the flip, the flip way of discussing this is the enemies, seven enemies of spiritual health. So I'll tell you that satisfaction is the enemy of spiritual health. I'm going to explain. You have to form the habit of dissatisfaction. I've did, I did a study on the men who work with God. These are men who were never satisfied, no matter the spiritual state. And when I'm talking about satisfaction, I'm talking about demonstrated dissatisfaction. Not the one in your heart. Demonstrated dissatisfaction. If you take a look at Moses... The Bible tells us, Exodus 33, from verse 10, what Moses was crying out for. Let's look at Exodus 33. We can quickly read from verse 12, just cut short our time. Uh, let's look at verse 12. Now, this man, before he got to this point, this was after they had left Egypt. They had crossed the Red Sea. They had come in and they were now going to march into Canaan. The Bible said, then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name. And you have also found grace in my sight. Let's look at 13, possibly 14. 
Now therefore I pray. Watch what this man is praying. And this is when he had an, a, an encounter with God. If you read up, the Bible says, but let's just stay here so don't move on. The Bible said that a pillar of cloud descended. And so this was God giving Moses kind of like a blank check. He says, now therefore I pray. If I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you. Excuse me. This prayer may not sound particularly big to you. If you don't understand the profile of the man praying that I may know you. At the time this man was crying out to God that I may know you. I'm asking myself, what more is there to know about God? When you stood and divided an entire Red Sea. What more is there to know about God? When he saved you as a three month old baby, when other people, your mates died. What more is there to know about God? When you were, you lift up, you take sand, throw it in the air. It will become boils on the bodies of the Egyptians. You will take a rod, strike it and water will turn to blood. You will speak to the star and the star and the moon and sun will be obeying the command of a man. A man will point and darkness will hit the whole of Israel. Joshua learnt it from somewhere. That time when Joshua pointed to the sky and said, let the sun stand in the valley of Ajalon. And the Bible said the sun stood still. He, that wasn't the first time that thing was practiced. Moses was the first to look at the sky and point and say, darkness over the land of Egypt. And darkness for three days came over a land. What more he said to know about God? After demonstrating signs and wonders, after hearing God face to face, after seeing the burning bush, after deep encounters with God, what more is there to know? But this man had formed a habit of dissatisfaction. His soul was never satisfied. He always wanted more of God and there was demonstration of the wanting more of God. He's not saying, oh God, I want you. After that, what have you done about wanting more of God? These are men. Let me tell you why the midnight prayer has power. It's not about the time. It is about the Father. When others find comfort on their bed, you're saying, no, Lord. No, Lord, I want to know you. You leave your bed. You lie on the floor. You're crying out. I want to know you. It is that hunger, demonstrated hunger that pulls God. It is not because you prayed it at 12. If you use the name of Jesus at 2, 3, 4, 5, it works. The Bible didn't say at the mention of the name of Jesus at 12 midnight, demons will bow. He never told us that every time you mention his name. So why is it that Paul and Silas, when they prayed at midnight, God responded because that is a time when others are on their bed relaxing. These men, it was a time to rise up, praise God. It was a time to rise up to worship God. Demonstrated hunger. Don't get satisfied. Don't get satisfied. Seek for more. If you don't seek for more, you would have formed a habit of spiritual satisfaction. You just get to that point and you stay there. How do I know you stay there? Because we are not seeing, God is not seeing the effort you are making for more. God is not seeing that you want to know him more. Demonstrate the hunger. Look at Paul, Philippians chapter 3 verse 9. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3 verse 9 quickly. We can look at 9 and 10. This is Paul. And this is what he was crying after. He said, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness. I'm actually going to verse 10, but it's fine. Which is from the law. But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Let's go to verse 10, which is actually where we're going to. He said, this is what he's crying after. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. What more is there to know about God? Now, I read my Bible in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. And Paul was writing. He said that they showed him things that ordinary men, they didn't show ordinary other men. So, excuse me, and I went to check which letter was written first. Is it Corinthians or Philippians? Is it that maybe Paul had already been crying out and said, Oh God, I want to know you. And then, because of that cry, God now showed him, he now had this experience. He said, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know. God knows. He says, such a one was caught up in the third heaven. Verse 3. This is Paul was writing about himself. I know such a man, whether in the body or out, I do not know. God knows. Let's look at the next verse. Bible says, he was caught up into paradise and heard what? Inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So they showed him these deep mysteries about God. But guess what? A man who had gotten to that point where no other human had gotten to. He was his saying that I may know you. I marveled at Philippians chapter 3 when he said, I want to win Christ. What more are you winning of Christ? When you have been taken into realms, no other person was. You know, 
we as Christians are satisfied with just enough. Just enough is the enemy of spiritual health. You've done one hour. Your ministry has done this. You have taught that. And so you feel satisfied. Nah. Don't get used. It's the enemy. You see what is called satisfaction? People do don't press in for more. People who are not crying out for more. It is a state of heart that kills spiritual health. There is even a blessing. That's why when Jesus was preaching the book of Matthew chapter 5, he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. In other words, just that you hunger and that you test, there's a blessing already that comes by hungering and by testing. Let me tell you the disadvantage of this. This is where you get tired of the, you get used to spiritual things. You get tired. You don't push for more. You know how people, they cry out to God in prayer and fasting. They want to get married. This will explain to you why the moment they get married, that's the end of the hunger for God. Which is why I told you that people who pray emergency prayers, you know what emergency prayer is? It's a prayerless life. Where you are praying for a particular thing, the moment you get that thing, is all over. But God was saying, I'm looking for, build a habit where you are never satisfied. You know how people are never satisfied in their career? They want more. So we get a, a um, what's the first one? Secondary school degree. And then you get a first degree. And then you get your master's, you get your postgraduate diploma, and then you get your PhD. And then after, I think, after PhD, you now get your professorship. People at, after that, because they didn't know what else to call it, they started doing certifications. So I know a man who has about 32 certifications, only him, one person. What is that? It is a dissatisfaction with where you are. Don't get satisfied. Don't develop that kind of heart. The first habit, you must cry out to God, God, please, don't put me in that state where I am satisfied. Don't put me in that state where I have enough of you. Help me to have demonstrated hunger. You know what is demonstrated hunger? It is a hunger that goes beyond the lips. It is a hunger that is shown in the things that you do. This is what happens to people and why they become lukewarm. When they come to God, after, so after that initial first time with God, they get satisfied and they are used to being satisfied. When you notice your spiritual temperature has gone down, don't be satisfied with lukewarmness. Let me tell you, because this generation is satisfied, this problem is not, um, it's not a habit we have formed. So we are used to this kind of life. No fire, no hunger for God, and we think this is normal. So when you see people that are on fire for God, you think they are abnormal. No, you are the one that is abnormal. Do you know the people we call fanatics are the normal people? You are the one that is, ha has a very big problem. But guess what? Because we have formed a habit of being satisfied with the status quo and we are okay with it. Well, I give my life to Christ. I speak in tongues. I've joined the choir. I'm in the department. Maybe they've made me a pastor. I have 2,000 people in my church and that's fine. We are satisfied with that level. If you have seen the face of God once, ask for twice. If you have prayed for 10 hours, ask for 20. Whatever it is, say, God, this is not enough. Be like the Moses people. Never be satisfied with enough. No matter the amount of God you have, ask for more. No matter the depth of God, ask for more. Let that be a habit of your soul. Where you have an insatiable hunger, an insatiable desire. You're going to cry out to God and say, oh God. Which is that prayer that David was praying for his son. He said, give this man a loyal heart forever. What does it mean forever? A habit. A habit of always looking for more of God. Psalm 27 verse 5 is actually a prayer of habit. It's a prayer of custom. Let's take a look at it. Psalm 27 verse 5 quickly and then I'll go to the next habit which I'll stay a little bit more on. I want you to consciously build that habit because when we finish, I'm going to give us some time to go on our faces and pray. One of the, 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 the marks of this, what has happened to us because of time is when I was being brought, brought up as a believer, what we're used to is after the message, when we don't, we're not quick to rush off. Which is why the quality of believers we have today, um, they're half-baked. When the message goes forth, at the end of the session, we're not quick to run off. People find a corner. And you know what? They go there and begin to cry out to God. And pray in those things. And that is where encounter begins. God has, is speaking now. But you know what? You need to go and pray in those things. Because we're going to give it time. For you to find a corner. Go to one corner. Thank God the hall here is rock. Wherever you are watching from. And start planning now where you're going to go. While the worship keeps playing at the background. Find a corner. This is how men are made. This is how men are built. Because sometimes 
in five minutes, the Spirit of God has not done the job. You need to give God time. If you are going to be a person that is going to turn out right, you need to give God time. You have to have a habit of giving God time. Don't be satisfied with waking up every day and not giving God time. Let me tell you, we worry about time, tight of money. What about the tight of your time? Out of 24 hours, the minimum is 2 hours, 40 minutes at the minimum. I don't see anyone worried about tight, time, tight of time. You're going to give God time. You're going to give God time. You're going to give your spiritual development time. Get used to time spent with God. It is a habit. Time spent with God. Make it an everlasting habit. Psalm 27 verse 5, this is a prayer. It was a prayer of habit. He said, for in the time of trouble, let's look at 4 first. This verse. Uh -huh. One thing have I desired that I will seek. That is what I'm going to seek. What does it mean to desire and seek? Desire is a state of the heart. Seeking is an action. Seeking is the demonstration of what you have desired. That is why I say demonstrated hunger. Not hunger in the mouth. Demonstration. If you say you are hungry for God, where is the evidence? If you say you are thirsty for God, where is the evidence? A man that is hungry for God does not stay 12 midnight on his bed. A woman that is thirsty for God does not lie down throughout the night. A man that wants more of God is beyond what you say with your lips. It is what you do. He said, that will I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. That sentence speaks of habit. This is what I'm crying after. I want to have a habit where I'm not satisfied. Let this be my lifestyle where I am always crying out for God. Why I am never satisfied. Lord, if you take anything away, let this, let, don't take this one. Let this be the number one habit. Let it be said of me that I am that one that has formed the habit as, her, as was her custom, always seeking more of God. As was her custom, always seeking to dwell in the house of the Lord, to dwell in the presence of the Lord. I saw studying Caleb, but we don't have to go there. The Bible says, God was talking about Joshua and Caleb. And he said, because Caleb has another spirit, but that was, they didn't put full stop. They said, and he has served me wholeheartedly. Because I was asking God, what made these two men have a different spirit? I saw it in the Bible. He said, because he had a different spirit and he served me wholeheartedly. I saw that wholehearted service to God is what inspires faith in God in the midst of the impossible. That, that's why in the presence of God, nothing looks impossible. You are so filled with faith. You are so filled with courage. When you come out again and you see the giants, you're like, eh, well... Because there's something about the presence of God that makes giants look like ants. So when you come out of the presence of God and that giant still looks like a giant, it means you have not given God enough time. It means you have not given God enough time to rewrite the code of fear in your heart. But let's go. Okay, let's read this. But my servant Caleb has a different attitude than others. Oh, dear Lord. Lift your hand and say, God, give me a heart that is loyal. A wholehearted heart. This is what separated Caleb. What made him see a giant and say we are able to go in and possess the land? What made this man? He said, but my servant Caleb, he has a different attitude. He has a different heart. He has a different lifestyle than others. What is that different lifestyle? He has remained loyal to me. He has remained loyal. May you be like Caleb. May you be like Joshua. He has remained loyal to me because of that. So I will bring him into the land he explored. This is what shaped Caleb and Joshua. A heart loyal to God. He shaped the outcome of his life. Go back to that scripture where we we're just reading about Caleb. He said, This is what I know. I don't, for whatever reason, we're focused on. The other part, a heart. We just read the nine numbers. You just read it, the last scripture that we read. You know, we focus on the different heart. But the Bible says because he had a different heart, he had a different attitude and all of that. The Bible says, okay, but my servant Caleb, I think this is NKJV version. He said because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring him into the land where he and his descendants shall inherit. If you look, look at King James, he said he has followed me whole heart. 
repeatedly. And that was what shaped the outcome of Caleb's life. You know what it means to follow God how heartedly? Not half. Not satisfied. The NIV says, but, my, but because my servant Caleb has a different spirit. I don't know why we normally put a full stop here. But that's not what the Bible says. He said he has a different spirit and follows me. You know what it means to follow? He didn't say and met me. Follows me and Jesus is going. You're not satisfied. You continue going. Follows me wholeheartedly. I will bring him into the land he went to. And his descendants will inherit it. Worship the descendants of Caleb. Because their father was one who wholeheartedly followed Jehovah. I've not seen yet anybody who wholeheartedly followed God and had cause to regret it at the end of the day. Growing up early, I used to read that scripture that, that says, now I'm young, uh, since I was young, now I'm old, I've never seen the righteous beg for bread or a seed forsaken. Then I used to ask God a question, but I see many people who go to church who are serious with you, who are begging for bread. God said, nah. In your opinion, they follow me. I know those who are mine. I know those who are mine. His, his, their father wholeheartedly followed God. I perceive that just before they went on that expedition, Joshua and Caleb went to the presence of the Lord. They stayed there. They gave God time. They were not satisfied with Moses' description of God. Joshua stayed with God. Caleb stayed with God. When they came out of that presence, that's when they now marched into that place. When they saw the giants, there's, have, you, have you been in the presence of God? Nothing is a challenge. When you look at what was the problem before you entered the secret place, you're wondering, why was I afraid? That was what produced Caleb and Joshua. The Bible tells us about Joshua's own experience, that even when Moses will finish, that's, that's number 33, when Moses will finish with God, the Bible says Joshua, the son of Nun, he refused to come out of, the, of that place. He was not satisfied because he had developed a habit of what? Time with God. A habit that is no, he's not satisfied with enough of God. He's not satisfied. Hallelujah. I want us to quickly go to, because I can't take the seven, but let's take a look at number two. The second one is the one most people don't like. But I'm going to tell you, everyone that has made sense with God, this habit is compulsory. This is the one most people don't like to build as a habit. I'm going to tell you what it is, and it is to hate pleasure. Seek chastisement, hate pleasure. The enemy of spiritual health is comfort. The writer of Ecclesiastes said, that one that loves merriment shall not be rich. The enemy of spiritual health, I'm telling you the number one enemy of spiritual health is comfort and I'm going to explain it to you. The flesh likes enjoyment. The flesh likes a comfort, I mean comfortable place. Your spirit needs chastisement to grow. God cannot start anything serious with you until he takes you out of your comfort zone. Nobody has ever been what they would typically call God general or whatever it is from a place of comfort. When God wants to start the journey with you, the first thing he does takes you away from Pharaoh's palace. Because you cannot be useful to God in Pharaoh's palace. Name anyone who has made sense. Anyone who has amounted to anything spiritually is a man that hates comfort. The Bible says, he who loves pleasure will be what? A poor man. And he who loves wine and oil will not be rich. Now, this is not just talking about wealth in the physical. You can never be spiritually rich if you like pleasure and comfort. It's impossible. I'm going to show you from the scripture. Don't develop a habit of comfort. Don't develop a habit of let's affair. Oh, it's okay. Don't develop it because you are pampering the flesh. The, no father can raise a child with chocolate, sweet, gum, all those things. You destroy that child. Let's, let's, let's take a look at a few examples. I'll tell you quickly. This is a problem with Solomon. It doesn't get better than being the son of David. Your father prayed for you, blessed you. You saw his lifestyle. You saw his example. You saw how he wholeheartedly followed God. You saw that God blessed him by serving God and all of that. You saw it. Moses, uh, David did everything to help Solomon. 
to become all that God had planned for him to be. Then what went wrong with Solomon? Last week we said that Solomon never asked God for anything. He didn't ask God for a wholehearted heart. But I'll tell you one more thing that was a problem of Solomon. He had everything he so wanted. Solomon never worked for one thing in his life. Mention one thing that Solomon worked for. The wisdom he got, he slept the next morning, he got wisdom. The wealth that he got, he slept one day, he became wealthy. Being the son that took over from David, he didn't work for that position. It was bestowed on him. He never worked for it. He didn't labor for anything. All the women he married, they came. A whole queen of Sheba left her house in Ethiopia, traveled all the way. Solomon never worked a day in his life for anything that he got. That was his destruction. Look at how the God raised David. That's how to raise God's general. <laughs> he was in the wilderness, number one. They pulled him from there to start with. Rough man. They now brought him and anointed him. But God understood. If I take David from this place now, after being anointed the first time, take him and put him on the throne of, the, of Israel, he will fail God, hands down. There's no gain saying he will fail God. This is the problem with Adam. He just slept one day. Woke up in the morning and he was the owner of an entire estate. Even wife. Some of you are fasting for two million years for wife. God has not answered. But you see, Adam slept casually. Woke up the next day, woman was there. Grown woman. He didn't struggle. He didn't do anything just like that. And that was why he, 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 he was destroyed. Look at how God raised Jesus. The Bible says, we read it in, in uh, Luke 2. He said, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. What does brought up mean? Where he was raised. Where he was trained. He who don't get satisfied with pleasure. Anybody training you with pleasure is destroying you, but you won't know. I was raised with iron fist. Not from my father's house. But the pastor that raised me, he didn't allow us to have all this casual. You know, I see the training, casual, whatever. No. We turned out this way because of the strong training. I'm going to show you from the scripture. Look at, let's take a look at some of those guys that, um, do you know that David was actually crying for child? Okay, let's even take a do some work in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23 to 24. Then let's do some work with Paul. That will be 2 Corinthians. So we're going to read 23 and 24. Maybe one or two translations so that we'll get a clear picture of what Jeremiah was saying. No wonder Jeremiah turned out this way. He said, oh Lord, I know, the, I know the way of man is not in himself. Now, pause. I need to make a statement here. There are people that God is training. Hmm? They don't understand that it's God's training process. So they are discouraged because things don't seem to be going the way it looks to be going for others because God's hand is on you. If you will lay hold of what God wants to do with your life, if you will lay hold. How does God raise an Abraham? It's not in the king's palace. How does God raise a Moses? It's not in the king's palace. How does God raise a David? It is not in the king's palace. Everyone, how does God raise a Moses? It's not in the king's palace. For Moses' life to count wilderness. For Abraham's life to count, he had to go through those times. Because the enemy of spiritual health, comfort. There are those who love their bed. If you read Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, those who love their bed, they sleep, they roll from one side of the bed to the other. You are destroying what God wants to do with your life. You see, this is your knee. They must be grazed in the place of prayer. God doesn't raise anybody in the palace. Nation one person raised in the palace. Everybody that started in the palace, look at Moses. He was in the palace. In my thinking, if God was going to use Moses, what better place than the palace? You're already there. Just wait for Pharaoh to die. Take over and sign a decree. Okay, all Israel, you are now free to go. Isn't that easy and better? Why did God have to take them, take him to number one? He went and spent 40 years. If you look at Moses, you think that God really hates him. You will say, wow, after you have been faithful to God, look at where your life is. If you look at Joseph, for God to fulfill what God had planned, Joseph, the Bible says God was the one that sent him to Egypt. If you look at the book of Psalms, don't go away from here. Maybe after this, we look at um, the book of Psalms. I think it's 105. He said he bound him with fetters of iron. Who bound him? God. Joseph would not have amounted to anything staying under Jacob because he was the last born. He was spoiled. When others were in the field harvesting whatever they were harvesting, Jacob was at home, relaxed. God said, nah, it's time to shake this up. Joseph, I have more for you than sitting under Jacob. 
Potiphar's house. Prison. This thing all awaits you. But this is your journey to greatness. Form a habit that loves chastisement. You sit in, don't turn there. Psalm 6 verse 1. I'm trying to be quick. Psalm 6 verse 1. David was actually asking God. He said, oh God, chastise me. But let's see Jeremiah first. Then we'll look at Psalm 6 1. He said, oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Let's explain that. You might desire to live a life of holiness. But the Bible says, <laughs> it is not in man to direct his own way. How many times have we wanted to live holy lives and we are not able to? Correct? How many times have we wanted to do this and this and this and that? We have desired it, but we are not able to. Has it happened to you before? May I see your hand? Okay, great. So this is what the guy was saying. I have desired it, but I have realized it is not in man to direct his own steps. Then he now knew the solution. He said, oh Lord, correct me. Because he knew when God brings the chastisement, when he brings it tough, there's something about being tough. There's something about bruising the flesh that raises a man that God can use. That raises a man that will step into the place of destiny. This generation where I used to comfort, quick, five minute service, two minute service, God does not come in two minutes. You can't force God to give you an encounter in two minutes. He doesn't raise men. Raising men, look at the Bible. 21 years, he's still working on a man. He said, but with justice, not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. He was asking God, correct me. Look at uh, Psalm 6 verse 1. Then we'll do it. So I'm working in New Testament, Second Corinthians. I want to end in the next five minutes so that we can have time to pray. Oh Lord, don't rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your rage. Let's look at it in another translation. Have compassion on me for I'm weak. I know, but I want to look at it in another translation. Oh Lord, which one is this? Oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your rod. What he's saying is, I'm accepting the rebuke, but please don't do it in hot displeasure. Rebuke me. I'm, he didn't say, God, don't rebuke me at all. He said, rebuke me, but not in your anger. He said, oh Lord, rebuke me, but not in your anger. Rebuke me, but not in your anger. Let me prove to you that this thing is rebuke me, but not in your anger. Because when you pull a scripture, you want to know exactly where the commas and the full stop were. So you look at other, trans other um, verses of the Bible so that it will give you the clear picture of this. Let's take a look at, um, we can do 2 Corinthians 12, we can do Hebrews 12, 5. Whichever one you pull up, we'll talk about that and then we'll pray. So whichever one you come. You can, okay, let's look at 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Okay, great, 7. This is Paul. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, pause. God desired for Paul to make it. God wanted Paul to be a general. What was his solution? He said, God has shown me all these great things. So to keep me from becoming proud, in other words, to kill pride, to kill the works of the flesh, to kill that thing that destroys other generals because there are things that destroy generals. Solomon, women destroyed him. Even his father David, he almost allowed women to destroy him. For to kill that thing that destroys generals, he said, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from what? becoming proud that thing be, develop the habit of hating pleasure go to God and say perfect me oh God but not in your anger chastise me oh God take me through that process that will refine the rough edges in my life without those refining process you can't become what God wants you to be which is why God desires to use you he finds that he can't I'm going to look at Malachi chapter 3 verse 2 very quickly. He said to keep me, God wanted Paul to make it. He wanted Paul to end well. He had to buffet him. Let's see. No, before we leave um, 2 Corinthians, we're going to, should we look at this? Okay, now that you're here, that's fine. He's, so let's look at the next verse. He said, even, let's look at verse 8 of this. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. You know when you're the one crying to God? asking God, take this away. You think that God is wicked by not answering. But what God was doing is helping him to destroy that thing 
that destroys generals, buffeting the flesh. There are many things. Look, look, let me tell you, God is a father. And as a father, he's a disciplinarian. Nobody can raise you more than God can raise you. Nobody. God knows how to raise people. But you have to allow him. He said three different times, I begged the Lord to take it away. This is what God said. He said, you, Paul, the way I'm seeing you, see your eyes, I'm seeing that your eyes are shining red. The way I'm seeing you. He said, each time he said to me, after praying and fasting for 40 days, they're going to say, oh, God, Paul, hmm? you see you. My grace is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. So he said, so after some time, Paul understood it. He said, so now I am glad. He now began to cooperate with God. He said, I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can walk through me. When we say that power of Christ, I know what you're thinking. Maybe money or one lovely thing. Nah. The power of Christ is the power of the cross. The cross needs to do a work in your life. Let's quickly look at Hebrews and then we'll look at Malachi chapter 3 and then we'll go and pray. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 5 and then we'll look at the scripture in Malachi. God's training process because I can't go through the other habits. Number one habit, can we take it? Okay, so fine. Let's do this. Have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. What does that mean? God brings discipline on his children. Don't give up when he corrects you because some people have a tendency to give up. You have to understand that you are in the hand of a loving father. You have to understand that before you have that need, he knows. Why is he allowing you to go through it when you know you have done everything you ought to do? Because beyond meeting your need, God wants to use you. Beyond that child you are looking for, God wants to use you. Beyond that job you are looking for, God wants to use you. He wants to send you in that industry as a voice. He wants to, the Bible says, with the comfort which you are comforted, we're able to comfort others. Beyond God giving Abraham a child, he wanted to do more than give Abraham a child. He Look at, how do you think God will raise an Abraham? The one that will be the father of nations. You don't raise him anyhow. Father of many nations. Because one man followed God who hearted it. Three religions get their bearing from one man. Christianity, for Abraham is their father. Islam, Abraham is their father. Jews, Abraham is their father. You, nothing. Why? It requires wholeheartedness. Abraham paid for it 25 years crying out to God for a child. No matter what you think, God is not mean. He's only bringing you to a place where you can be used of him. Let's look at the next verse. Then we'll look at Malachi 3 and we'll have to end it here. For the Lord disciplines those he loves. And hey Lord, can you say this after me? Those in the life and in the physical audience. Like, is this still God or maybe this is another person? He, can we say it together? One, two, three, go. Mm, this doesn't sound like the God we've projected in the 21st century. For, God, for the Lord disciplines those he loves. He punishes everyone he accepts as a child. So if I want God to accept me as a child, I'm going to be crying now. That's why David, he understood this. That's why he went to go and pray. He said, God, I don't really like the punishment. So God, as you are, as you are punishing me and chastising me, shall do it in love and kindness. He didn't need to tell God that God by nature will do it out of love and kindness. Listen to me, eh? God controls the heat that's operating in your life. He knows when to increase the heat. He knows when to turn it down. He's your father. He knows when to flog you. He knows when to withhold the key. He's your father. This is his day. Yes, we'll say Father's Day in the physical, but this is a Father's Day. I've never seen a good father without discipline. If you allow people to have everything they want, you destroy them. Can we take a look at Malachi chapter 3? The Bible says God loves every, God disciplines everyone he loves and punishes. So you can imagine the kind of prayer when you hear somebody pray, oh God, punish me. Or imagine if I begin to prophesy, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask, oh God, today, that you punish everyone that is seated in congregation and those watching me online. If there were 300 people watching, you just see left, 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 left. True or false? Can you imagine if I go for a crusade? How many of you want to be God's children? 1,000 people will come out. And then the next sentence, 
Father, in the name of Jesus, from today, begin to punish them. Ah, this is not the Jesus they told us about. And this is why God's generals are no more being raised. But who shall abide and endure it when he comes? Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? For he will be like a blazing fire that refines metal. What kind of fire? Blazing fire is refining metal. You are metal, but you need refining. He said, or oh, like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. Your clothes need to be bleached, not just washed. You know, there's a washing of the blood of Jesus. But apart from that, there's the bleaching. The one that the cross takes care of. Look at verse 3. Of the, the next verse. Uh, he will sit. You know what it means to sit? He's not, he is not touch and go. He will sit like a refiner of silver. You are refining silver. Burning away the dross. Some of us have a lot of dross in our lives. Pride does not go by saying, God, have mercy on me. I committed pride. No. See how they remove pride in Paul. Dross. Dross needs to go. It takes fire to burn it away. He said, burning away the dross. He will purify the Levites. They are Levites, but they need purification. Refining them like gold and silver. God is going to sit on you. If God wants to use you, sometimes he sits on you for 40 years doing this process. 30 years doing this process. If you're a lover of pleasure, you will not yield to this process of God. So that they may once again offer acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. Let me tell you, Jesus said, as I round this up, because I'm out of time, I want us to pray. Jesus said, the road is narrow. It's difficult. How can someone who is a lover of pleasure go through that road and come out at the end? You have to be prepared for that road. And that road requires some roughening up. When God denies you certain pleasure, it is for your own good. When God allows you to go through certain processes that are not pleasant, it is for your own good. The Bible says that everyone that God loves, he corrects. Everyone, everyone he accepts as a child. What does he do? The Bible says he brings punishment on those ones. That is why Solomon was, uh, David was praying, Oh God, oh God, chastise me, but do it in love. Oh God, I'm begging you. I know your own chastise, do it in love. Jeremiah said, was crying out for the same punishment. This is the downfall of Solomon. He saw the father like that, but he was enjoying the benefits of a man who has served God. Look at how God raised David. Running up and down in the wilderness, an anointed king. Some of us, today, 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 they make you a pastor. The next day, you already have seven assistant pastors. One will carry your Bible, two will carry your jacket, three will carry your bag. Which is why I hate people carrying my bag. I carried the bag from my house, from my room, came downstairs. My bag was not too heavy. I now want to walk just from the door to my seat. You carry my bag. Why? If you're going to carry my bag, then you must be ready to carry the bag of every woman or man who comes into the church. Anointed king. He was running around. Saul was chasing him everywhere. Many times he hungered. Many times he tested. He was part of the building process. There was a time David was so discouraged. The Bible said David was so discouraged. He had lost everything. The Bible said, well, he encouraged himself in the Lord. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Because the building process of God is not always fun and dance. There is pressure that needs to be applied on you. We are not used to it in generation. That's why God cannot find generals again. We are the Kenekegans. We are the Kajankumans. We are the Deborahs. We are there. We are the 12 disciples. We are those that will take campus ministry to another level. They are nowhere because we are lovers of pleasure. Pleasure is the enemy of spiritual health. You know, our pastors, every Sunday after church has ended by 11, they sit down. From time to time, we start those meetings from around 12 till 5. Many don't understand that process. It's not easy, but that is what it takes to stretch you. Until you are stretched, you cannot be used of God. That hammer must come. He said, I, God, you know what I do? I walk with you in the valley of the shadow of death. You are in the shadow of death. The only thing, you go to the shadow of death, though, the only thing is I guarantee I will be with you. But shadow of death, you must pass it. He said when the water will, when, will overflow you and all of that, Isaiah 43, that water you must go through. The only thing, I will be there. I will be there. Don't form a habit. So what am I saying? What's the second habit of a healthy soul? A soul that has a habit of Looking for chastisement. Or pruning. Have a habit of pruning. Every time you're asking God, prune me more, oh God. Stretch me more, oh God. Chastise me more, oh God. Stretch me that I can be used of you. It is impossible for me to have been like this. Without
all that chastising process. A lot of people come to me, Rev, I want to be like you. Lay hands on me. I wish it was about laying on of hands. It would have been simple. After Jesus had laid hands on the disciples, then their journey began. They all died horrible deaths. Yet they serve God more than you and I. Why did they end that way? Because to, for, to have your name written on the foundation of heaven, you're going to pay a price. You're going to pay a price. I want us to cry out to God. We're going to find a corner. We're going to go back to the, find a corner. On your face, you're going to cry out, oh God. The first prayer, I'm going to pray the first one. Don't allow me to be satisfied. I want to be like Caleb, oh God. Wholehearted desire. Give me the habit of not wanting enough. Give me the habit of not being satisfied, Lord. The habit, I don't want to be satisfied. I don't want to be satisfied no matter what I gain in this life. No matter how I grow spiritually. If I pray 10 hours, let me not be satisfied. If I encounter you, I don't want to be satisfied. No matter the miracles I see, I don't want to be satisfied. No matter how tall I grow, I don't want to be satisfied, oh God. Let me have that habit of dissatisfaction, oh God. We're going to cry and we're going to spend some time in a place of prayer. We're going to spend some time in prayer. This is how it is built. After you have heard the word, that word has to enter you. It has to enter your spirit, man. It has to go into your spirit and it is crying out to God. Cry out to God. This is where the message goes from your head to your spirit. Believe me, all you have heard is just in your head. All you have heard is just in your mind. It needs to go to your spirit. And it's by telling God, I notice that I don't have the habit of, of satisfaction, Lord. I have the habit of being easily satisfied. I don't want to be satisfied. And after that, you're going to tell God, Lord, I give you permission to prune me. I give you permission to prune me, oh God. I give you permission, oh God. This trust in my life has got to go. It's got to go. It's got to go. You won't be able to make it. God cannot use you. He can't use you the way that you are. He can't use you the way that you are. There's too much flesh. There's too much words of the flesh. There's too much pride. There's too much self. There's too much self. There's too much, self. There's too much spiritual laziness. There's too much spiritual laziness. There's too much. Too much laziness. It's got to go. It's got to go. It's got to go. God can use you. God can use you this way. He has more for you. He has more in store. Your destiny is great. There's more. There's more. Immorality locks within you. There's too much loss of the flesh. It's got to go. Ask God for the fire of God. Tell him, Lord, I open. I'm open to your chastisement. I'm open to your chastisement. Stretch me, Lord. Stretch me, Lord. Tell God, let me hit my bed. Let me hit my bed. Your bed is the reason why God cannot use you. You have been a lover of comfort. It is time now time. What has comfort brought any man? Any man that has been used by God from Paul to Abraham to Moses to Joshua to Caleb. All of them. Tell oh God. Oh God. My life can be more than this. My life can be more than this. Go ahead and pray this. Tell God, bring me this understanding. I have heard it with my head. Let my spirit understand it. Oh God, oh God, oh God. I will not be satisfied with anything except wholehearted desire. Except the wholehearted desire for you, oh God. Pray this, pray this, pray this. Even as we log off from being online, as we are here, we're going to find the place. This is where God begins to walk in us. Gone are the days where we hear messages. And for the next one hour, we are on our faces before God. And for the next two hours, we are on our faces before God. Crying out and asking God, oh God, refine me. Malachi chapter 3 says he will sit like a refiner of silver. Oh God of Israel, you are my father. Take away the dross. Take me through the wilderness that will perfect me. He took Moses 40 years to become a man that God could use. He took four years of chastisement for him to be the person that God could use. There's too much trust in your life. There's too much. Tell him. I don't want to be lazy, oh God. I don't want to be lazy, oh God. I don't want to be lazy, oh God. Correct me, oh God. Tell him to bring correction. 
but not in his heart this pleasure tell him the Bible says everyone he loves he disciplines discipline is coming for the body of Christ discipline is coming for the body of Christ tell God help me to recognize your discipline when it comes help me to recognize your discipline when it comes oh God he says he punishes everyone he accepts as a child everyone he accepts tell him oh God in answer to this prayer God will bring some people in your life that may not be pleasant tell him oh some the Holy Ghost will do by himself others he will send your leader to do it they may not be nice they may not be kind but it is for you to become that man that woman that God can use no wonder Paul said I pay in my body the marks of Christ where are the marks of your training where are the marks of your preparation where are they <laughs> no one can casually become a general no one can casually become a vessel no one can become a vessel used by God by sleeping every night this is what destroyed Solomon he had everything he wanted never worked for anything in his life he was a lover of pleasure the Bible says what in Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 2 everything his heart desired he had every single thing that Moses that Solomon wanted he had it no wonder no wonder he turned out that way he was a sports child of God the Bible says at the end of the day, God was not happy with him. Tell the Lord, take this away from me, oh God. Take this away from me. This is the part of the equation that is missing in the 21st century. Make sure you're crying out to God. Say, God, look at my life. I present my life. Look at me, oh God. If you leave me this way, I'm done for. If you leave me this way, I am done for. Let your chest flow before God. Let him see that heart that is crying out for more. Take you. 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 Take you.